Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this um, seminar of the Bob Shackton History Society. I'm particularly pleased that this witness seminar is uh, being conducted by my good friend Justin Davis Smith, who uh, I saw from the blurb, he's been involved with volunteering for 25 years and a bit, I suspect, uh, because I think I've known him for that long. And uh, since, uh, since the days in which we set up the Bond Traction History Society, we co-edited a book, and I've known him on and off in his various capacities ever since. And those capacities have included, among many others, um, setting up and directing the Institute of Volunteering Research, and two of his successors in that role are with us tonight. Um, and then uh, becoming Chief Executive of Volunteering England and subsequently uh, taking the volunteering portfolio within NCBO when that was amalgamated with uh, Volunteering England. He's now retreated, if that's the right word, <laughs> uh, back to somewhere near his roots in the world of research. He's now a research, senior research fellow at Cass Business School. Uh, so from that history and perspective of change, he's going to give us his life in voluntary action in five short stories. Thank Just you. Again. Well, thank you very much, um, Colin, and thanks um, everybody for coming. Um, what I want to do this evening is to share with you something of my personal involvement in volunteering in the voluntary sector over the past 25 years or so, filtered through the lens of five short stories or vignettes which seemed to me to say something about the changes which have taken place in our movement over this time. And I know that you were saying the speech was billed as three stories, and you were asking, do I really need to sit through two more? But I can promise you they are reasonably short, and they're really just jumping off points to introduce some themes and issues, which seem to me to be of importance, and which I hope will resonate and perhaps even provoke. It's just that when I sat down to write this address, three stories seemed woefully inadequate for what I wanted to say to you this evening. So the period that I want to cover is one in which volunteering came much more centre stage in policy terms. It was rarely spoken of when I first started out, except by those already committed to it. But by 2012, it was a key plank of the Coalition's Big Society agenda. It was being lauded for its role in transforming the, Alum the London Olympic and Paralympic Games and was a central element of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I want to draw out some of the key themes and questions for discussion about the nature of volunteering and its place in modern society and the shifting interpretations of this meaning over time. First, a quick sketch of my career. After a doctorate in labour history, I worked for Jim Callaghan in Westminster as his political assistant and speechwriter doing a wide range of jobs, my favourite perhaps being to write a speech to the great man on the future of English cricket in his capacity as president of Sussex County Cricket Club. Interestingly, given my future career and research interests, Callaghan himself had been interested in volunteering and as Prime Minister had put forward plans for a good neighbour scheme. But the idea ran aground when he lost power in 1979 following the winter of discontent an issue which coincidentally would inform some of my earliest work in the sector and which I will come back to in a moment. When Callaghan went to the House of Lords in 1986, I left and joined the then Volunteer Centre UK in Burton St Hertfordshire as a research officer. The Volunteer Centre had been set up in 1974 following the recommendations of the AIDS Committee in the late 1960s into the role of volunteers in the personal social services and had been moved out of London as part of the government's efficiency drive in the late 1970s. I stayed at what ultimately became Volunteering England, following several mergers and rebranding exercises, for 20 years, firstly leading its research work and ultimately taking on the CEO role before, as Colin said, merging the charity with NCBO in 2012. Interestingly, NCBO had fought hard to take on the volunteering advocacy function in 1974, and had been opposed to the setting up of the new volunteer centre, which it feared would usurp a key dimension of its work. So the merger in 2012 was for NCBO, a logical and welcome return of a key plank of its work. 
1916, as Colin said, I came full circle myself in my career and rejoined the academic world, taking up a position of senior research fellow at Cass Business School to teach on their charity master's programme and to lead the newly acquired commission to write the history of NCVO for its centenary in 2019. As with all witness seminars, mine is a personal take on events and is deliberately filtered through my own career and experience. It is not intended as a definitive account of volunteering during this time. Perhaps I will turn my attention to this another time after I've finished the history of NCVO, but rather to offer some personal reflections on the topic, which I hope will resonate with you and lead us into a fuller discussion. And just to flag up some of the themes at the beginning that I hope to touch upon, they include relations between the volunteering movement and the state and the labour movement, questions of definition and impact, historical and international developments and shifting interpretations over time, and thorny issues of ownership, control and independence. And just to repeat, this is not the forum for me to draw upon copious amounts of academic literature, but rather to outline how these issues intersected with my own experience and involvement in the sector. And as I said at the outset, I will try and introduce my remarks through the frame of five short stories or vignettes. So story number one. My first substantive task on joining the Volunteer Centre in 1986 was to rewrite the drone guidelines governing relations between paid staff and volunteers. These had first been developed in the aftermath of the winter of discontent, which as I have already noted saw off the Callaghan government, when the unions and volunteer groups fell out over volunteers crossing picket lines. The guidelines were named after Geoffrey Drone, a previous General Secretary of Nalgo, and a board member of the Volunteer Centre, who produced them in association with the unions and the volunteering movement to try and calm tensions and build support for the development of volunteering, particularly in the public services. For me, it was an interesting connection both with my work with Jim Callaghan a few years previously and to my doctorate on the government and industrial relations after the Second World War, when the use of volunteers as, as a strike-breaking tool was routinely adopted. And indeed, it referenced back to my wider interest in labour history and to the much mytho mythologised general strike of 1926, when enthusiastic bands of Oxbridge volunteers were remembered, perhaps not altogether correctly, as is often the way with myths, to have driven trains and buses during the strike an episode that informed much of the left-wing hostility to voluntary action which developed during the course of the 20th century. Incidentally, the chief executive of the Volunteer Centre had spoken out against volunteers crossing picket lines on the grounds that it would sour future relations, and in doing so had raised the wrath of Tory MPs in Parliament. It was an episode that was to influence future debates about the relationship between the left and the volunteering movement, and about the appropriate role for volunteers in the contested arena of the public services. The revised version of the drain guidelines which I developed updated the <coughs> context and the language from the original but basically held true to the original policy lines. Namely, volunteers in the field of public services should primarily be seen as complementary to the work of paid professionals and that all care should be taken to avoid them being seen to displace paid staff or undercut their terms and conditions of service. There was a broad consensus outside of some on the new right that if volunteering was to have a place in the development and delivery of health, social care, education and other essential services, then it was as a complement to the work of paid professionals. And in many ways it was a restatement of the classic extension ladder thesis put forward by Beatrice Webb in her minority report to the Poor Law Commission in the early years of the 20th century. Fast forward 25 years to Cameron's Big Society project and the current debate about the role of volunteers in the delivery of public services such as libraries. And you can see that there has been a significant unravelling of this consensus, which raises fundamental questions, again, about the appropriate role for volunteering and volunteers in our society. It is, I think, clearly time for a new debate about the roles of volunteers in the public services. And several commentators, such as Rob Jackson and Stuart Edrington and Carl and Others have argued that the language of job substitution is now redundant and we need a much more flexible and fluid approach to the issue. And though I would suggest that the strict demarcation lines of the past, if they ever existed, have long since blurred. 
If the money isn't there and is not coming back to pay for libraries, parks and museums staffed by paid professionals, then surely we need to look at alternative models, including a greater role for volunteers, so the argument goes. And yes, I am convinced that we need to have this debate, and I'm equally certain that part of the solution will be a rebalancing of the paid community contribution. But before we all jump onto the big society, or is it the shared society bandwagon, just a couple of observations. Aren't we all being told that the new world of volunteering is all about flexibility and informality, about micro-opportunities and peer-to-peer -peer social action? Not necessarily the form of volunteering best suited to keeping libraries open nine to five, six days a week. And don't we also know that volunteering levels have remained virtually constant over many years, despite successive governments' attempts to shift the dial, a point I want to return to later? And if so, isn't there a danger that if we can persuade local communities to take up the challenge of running the local library and the museum, this will be at the expense of volunteering elsewhere, in the hospital shop or in the Meals on Wheels? And let's not forget the equity argument and John Mohan's salutary work on charity deserts. Volunteering isn't always distributed in the areas in which it is most needed. And there was, I would argue, a, re a reason why the state stepped in at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. So in settling into my new role at the Volunteer Centre, I was keen to explore further some of these historical debates about shifting relations between the state and the labour movement and voluntary action. And I remember writing a paper on trade union volunteering relations for the UNOVA conference held at the LSE in 1981. The first time this august conference, I believe, had been held outside the United States and organised, I seem to remember, by one Colin Rochester. In it, I argue that the story of Labour's hostility to voluntary action was only a partial one, and that alongside this hostility, there was another story waiting to be told of Labour's support for, and indeed rootedness in, the principles of service and mutuality. It was a story which I believe deserved to be told, not only because of what it said about a future Labour government's attitude to the voluntary sector, but because of the light it shed on the sh shifting relationship between the state and the voluntary movement over time, what Geoffrey Finlayson has referred to as the moving frontier. So I did a couple of things to try and advance the debate, and here just a word of warning about the dangers of the witness seminar approach. If you're not careful, you can sound as if you are claiming sole ownership of initiatives and movements you have no right to appropriate. And I make no claims in any of these pronouncements for being the pioneer of these ideas and movements. Many historians and social scientists before me had been debating these issues for many years. But in a small way, I hope I was able to advance the debate. So along with a few fellow soulmates working in the sector, I helped to set up Labour Community Action to try and reclaim this alternative history of Labour. One, was that, one that was steeped in the values of mutuality and self-help. I was inspired by Clement Attlee himself, whose government was the subject of my doctorate, who alongside I was seeing perhaps the greatest expansion of the state in the 20th century, also espoused a strong commitment to voluntary action, which he had developed as a volunteer in the East End of London. First at Haleybury Public School Boys Club, Haleybury being his alma mater, and later at Toynbee Hall, where it is rumoured, myths again I think, as the dates don't quite work, that he wrote his famous book on social work which lays out very clearly his philosophy on voluntary action. As Mayor of Stepney, Attlee also attended the inaugural conference of the newly established National Council of Voluntary Service and spoke enthusiastically about the emerging new philanthropy which emphasised the importance of partnerships between the voluntary movement and the state. And as an aside, there is an excellent new biography of Attlee by John View, Citizen Clem, which explores this aspect of his philosophy and contains the fascinating nugget that after graduating from City University Law School, <coughs> and how I love these personal connections and coincidences, <coughs> I now proudly proclaim Attlee as an alumnus of my university, he was turned down for his first job by the Charity Commission. <laughs> how different things might have been. And I continue to write on the subject. I penned a comparative piece with Melanie Oppenheimer on labour voluntary sector relations in the UK and Australia, and teamed up with Nick Deakin to write a piece on labour and charity in the British Council book, Ages of Voluntarism. I like to think if we were not exactly pioneers, then at least we were ahead of the curve in terms of this revisionist approach to labour history, which was later picked up and explored in a slightly different way by first Blair with his third way and later Morris Glasman and others. <coughs> 
and the exponents of Blue Labour. But there was another initiative I was involved in around this time, of which I'm perhaps even prouder, and that was the setting up with two great colleagues, Colin Rochester and Rodney Headley, the Voluntary Action History Society, which I'm delighted is still going from strength to strength today. Again, I don't think any of us would be so presumptuous to lay claim to be the first historians to be interested in reclaiming such a crucial missing chunk of British social history. There were many pioneers before us, Josie Harris, Nick Deakin again, Frank Pahaska, Pat Sane, Jane Lewis, to name but a few. But the three of us who bridged an interest in history with experience of working in the sector were determined to set up a forum to exchange ideas and encourage new scholarship on the role and contribution of voluntary action and charity through the ages. I don't need to repeat at length here the gaps we were hoping to fill in British historiography. It is now well accepted that for most of the 20th century the history of voluntary action was largely ignored by historians and where dealt with at all tended to be as part of a Whiggish interpretation which saw voluntary action as a minor staging post on the road to the development of the welfare state. We felt that the story of the development of voluntary action was much richer and more nuanced than that and deserved greater attention. And through conferences, seminars, research papers and books of essays, I think the Voluntary Action History Society, much of it since the end of my active involvement, I hasten to add, has indeed made an important contribution to filling this gap in our social history. So the issue of the changing nature of relations between voluntary action and the state is the first and perhaps the most enduring question I've attempted to grapple with throughout my career. Story number two. So if story number one relates mainly to her, my historical interests, story number two relates to my social science interests, and if I'm being brutally honest, are the things I've been appointed by the Volunteer Centre to do, namely to help advance our understanding of and knowledge about the workings of this rather nebulous concept called volunteering. So my second main task, after the DRAIN guidelines, was to get funding for a new national survey of volunteering the first one having been carried out in 1981. And this new survey, funded by the Nuffield Foundation, eventually saw the light of day in 1991, together with a series of research papers on different aspects of the measurement of volunteering. In this work, I felt I was part of an exciting network of researchers, some within the sector, some outside, who were working together to build the sector's evidence base. It is a history that has been nicely told by Margaret Harris in a recent article in Voluntary Sector Review, taking an early university bases at Port Vac, LSE, South Bank, but also the work of key voluntary sector bodies such as CAF, NCVO and the Volunteer Centre. And I was pleased to be able to play a small part in the development of this body of knowledge, specifically on volunteering, through my position at the Volunteer Centre and through my involvement in and later chairing of the RVAP Research Network and engagement with the burgeoning North American voluntary sector research community. Again, I make no claim to inventing this work. I was privileged to follow in the footsteps of Diana Leet at the Volunteer Centre, who does, I think, have a claim to having invented some serious modern research on volunteering in this country. Although my current research on the history of NCBO shows that NCSS, as it then was, was busy investing in an intelligence department and research function as early as the 1940s. My research interests at this time were varied, Alongside the mapping of the size and shape, I was interested in exploring the motivations and barriers to giving and the impact of professionalisation within the sector on the voluntary impulse. Around this time, I managed to secure funding from the Lloyds TSB Foundation for the setting up of the Institute for Volunteering Research with Mike Locke at the University of East London, which again, I'm delighted to say, along with the Voluntary Action History Society, continues to go from strength to strength and which has done so much over the years to advance our understanding of volunteering. Oh, and I also set up a new journal, Voluntary Action, to help communicate and disseminate the findings of some of this newly emerging research. So phase two of my story is about mapping and understanding, about measuring and defining. And remember, this was a pre-post-truth era when these things were still seen as important. <coughs> so story number three. On the 17th of January 1995, an earthquake measuring 6.9 hit Kobe in Japan. It was the country's second worst earthquake in the 20th century and claimed over 6,000 lives. Overnight, tens of thousands of volunteers, mainly students, flocked to Kobe from Tokyo and the surrounding area to help out. 
it soon became apparent that there were no systems in place to mobilise and organise the volunteers, and that rather than helping, they were in danger of getting in the way of the rescue operation. The government immediately looked for outside help to advise on the way forward, as Japan had very little tradition of organised volunteering outside of the family, and I was asked to go to Japan to advise on the setting up of a volunteering programme, and I travelled regularly there over the next five years. The Kobe earthquake is generally seen as a turning point in Japan's attitude towards volunteering. But more importantly for this story, it is seen as the stimulus for a global awakening and interest in volunteering, in which the Institute for Volunteering Research was to play a significant role. The Japanese government immediately declared the 17th of January, the day of the earthquake, as National Voluntarism Day. But more significantly, then led a call within the UN for an international year to celebrate volunteering, which finally came to fruition in 2001. I was appointed by the UN as a consultant on the year, which involved producing a series of papers on volunteering and social development, taking part in a debate within the UN General Assembly in New York, and also speaking at the World Bank, which was developing its own interest in volunteering, and which had recently launched a social capital programme to generate research on this phenomenon newly invigorated by Robert Putnam and others. IVR was appointed to evaluate the impact of the year, and it was generally deemed to have been a success, well, as much as these global events can ever have judged to have been. The year was celebrated in over 100 countries, new research was commissioned, new strategies for volunteering were developed by government and civil society, and new laws passed to recognise volunteering. Perhaps more significantly at a global level, volunteering gained a greater visibility and currency within the UN system as a result of the year, culminating in the recognition of the importance of volunteering towards the achievement of the UN's sustain Sustainable Development Goals. Volunteering within the Sustainable Development Goals was not seen as an outcome in its own right, but as an important cross-cutting enabler in the delivery of these goals through its role in engaging citizens in decision making, delivering services and building community resilience. And perhaps looking back, this is the outcome I'm most proud of as I felt we had played a small part in widening the understanding of volunteering throughout the United Nations system. In some of the early workshops I was involved in, it was clear that there was a nascent hostility to the concept of volunteering from many within the UN movement, particularly from among the developing nations. This was in part the historic hostility of the left, which we have already noted, but it was expressed perhaps even more strongly in the hostility from the poverty lobby and the women's movement, who argued that volunteering, seen almost entirely through the lens of service delivery, was responsible for removing opportunities for paid employment, and in the case of the women's movement, reinforcing notions of unpaid gendered work. And again, without wanting to claim too much for this work, the typology which we developed and which underpinned the work of the year did appear to break through some of this resistance by repositioning volunteering in a broader context than simply service delivery. So alongside service delivery, volunteering was conceptualised as self-help, participation and campaigning, and the UN deliberately sought out examples of the way in which volunteering manifested itself in these different forms in different parts of the world. Colin Rochester would, lately help, would later helpfully refine this list and add serious leisure as a fifth dimension to this typology. And I'm sure that as our understanding of the nature of volunteering continues to grow, so this list will develop further. The International Year of Volunteers, I think, marks a high point in government support for volunteering around the world. And in the UK, the Blair government was fully into its stride with its Third Way project, in which the voluntary sector, or third sector as it was now being termed, and, volunteer and volunteering were seen as key components, Labour having relearned some of its past history by now. We were in a phase of what Jeremy Kendall has described as hyperactive policy making on the sector, with a torrent of policies to promote volunteering from experience corps to V, and culminating the in the appointment of a volunteer czar in Julia Neuberger. The jury is out over how successful these programmes were. Certainly some were less successful than others, but I don't want to mark the report card here. Rather, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes thinking about where this explosion of interest in volunteering came from, what issues it raised, 
and indeed raises more generally for the values and ethos of the volunteering movement. There were, I think, at least two intellectual currents flowing in favour of increased government interest in volunteering. Three, if you count the increased interest in social capital, although I would suggest that was rather more an interesting theoretical diversion than a fully-fledged intellectual movement. First, from the 1980s onwards, there had been a rediscovery of the notion of civil society, fuelled by the breakup of the old Soviet Union and the role it could play in building strong, cohesive and participatory societies. Civil society is, of course, as a concept much broader than volunteering, but for many writers, volunteering was seen as an important, perhaps a central component part. But perhaps even more pertinently in respect to the growing interest in volunteering was the resurgence of interest in another long-forgotten concept, that of active citizenship, which harked back to the idealist 19th century philosophy of Green, Toynbee and Hodgson, Hobson, and through, and through them much further back to the city-states of ancient Greece, and which was being rediscovered for a new age by political thinkers and politicians of various hues, from Douglas Hurd with his call for a return to Burke's small platoons, to David Blunkett's support for a new national citizen service for young people. Crucial to the rediscovery of active citizenship was an insistence on both the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, and volunteering was lodged very tightly in the responsibilities camp, fueling an idea that all in society, individuals, organisations and businesses alike, had a duty to give something back to society. But for some it went further. Not only did you have a responsi give, responsibility to give back, but your full citizenship was seen as conditional on your active involvement. These two centuries old intellectual traditions were being rediscovered through a new age and did much, I think, to spur government interest in the UK and around the world in volunteering. And this newfound government enthusiasm for volunteering was welcomed by many within the volunteering movement. But concerns were also being expressed about the dangers of too close an association with the state. Many writers from a civil society tradition argued that by definition the voluntary sector and volunteers should keep their distance, that the function of the sector was to act as a bulwark between the citizen and an overbearing state, and they regarded state funding of and support for voluntary groups with growing suspicion. This went for volunteering too. I well remember challenging Ralph Darendorf at a Goodman lecture once about his assertion that volunteers should never legitimately be involved with the stat statutory sector, but with the province alone of civil society. And this seemed to me both to fly in the face of a proud historical tradition of volunteering within the statutory services in this country, but also at odds with the notion that individuals should be free to volunteer wherever they wanted. But more concerning for many of us within the volunteering movement was the way in which the active citizenship ideology was beginning to be interpreted by policymakers. The argument appeared to go something like this. If full citizenship is dependent on active participation, volunteering, and if people are proving resistance to over, resistant to overtures from the state to get involved, then the next legitimate step was surely to nudge people more forcibly into such engagement. So there were policy moves towards the end of the Labour government to fast-track citizenship applications to those who could demonstrate that they were volunteering, and proposals from a number of local authorities to put active citizenship um, active volunteers to the top of the social housing queue or to qualify for a council tax rebate. But I felt strongly then, and still do, that compulsion and volunteering just do not mix, and that by going down that route we threaten to undermine the very essence of what makes volunteering different and special. I have no gripes with government attempts to make it easier for people to volunteer and see that as a perfectly legitimate and responsible role for government to take. And I share something of the idealist philosophy of the crucial role of personal engagement in building a strong, healthy and engaged society. But compulsion, no. Rereading Richard Titmus recently, he of the gift relationship, perhaps the best book on altruism ever written, I was struck by an ingenious repositioning of the rights and responsibilities argument, which seems to me to help us navigate a route through this paradox of state encouragement for what is at its core a voluntary act. For Titmus, volunteering is categorised not as a responsibility, but as a right, the right to give. And this seems to me a perfect way of squaring the circle and of avoiding the trap, of falling into the trap of coercion. If volunteering is the reciprocal activity that we all claim it to be, 
if it is as much about personal development and learning as giving back, then surely everyone in society has the right to take part, and government should ensure that as far as possible, all barriers to engagement are removed. But you don't force someone to take up their rights, you simply make the opportunities and benefits known, and you clear the path. So the right to volunteer seems to me the perfect call to arms for the future development of our movement. Okay, story number four. During the summer of 2012, volunteering was widely seen to have come of age in the United Kingdom. The games makers, clad in their purple and pink uniforms, were the public face of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, the games widely regarded as one of the most successful of modern times. One survey carried out during the Games suggested that some 40% of the British public wished they'd been games makers. I've written elsewhere about the lessons to be drawn from the Games for volunteering, and I don't want to repeat myself here. Its success was clearly down to strong vision and leadership from LOCOG, great training and support. But also, and this is the one lesson which, surprise, surprise, the government failed to draw, investment. We don't know how much the volunteering programme cost, but it was at least £10 million and probably significantly more. As Chief Executive of Volunteering England, I've been asked to help with putting together London's bid to host the Games, which had identified volunteering as a strand to set it apart from other bidding nations. And following London's successful nomination, I was asked to write the strategy for volunteering for the Games as part of a widely joined advisory group. And I just want to make three observations about the Games and what it says about volunteering and the role of government. First, its very success, paradoxically, suggests just how difficult it is for government to stimulate volunteering. Yes, participation rates rose in the year or two following the Games, but they soon returned to their historic, albeit in international terms, relatively high levels. Indeed, since volunteering has started to be regularly measured over the past 15 years, rates have deviated by less than 5% in only two years, once following the Games, and once in 2005, when the only logical explanation appears to be that the survey picked up the millions, millions of people involved in anti-war demonstrations in that year. So short of hosting an international jamboree each year, or taking the country into a dubious war, <laughs> government le leverage appears pretty limited, and certainly without any investment, which takes me to my second point. The Games came two years into the coalition government at the height of interest in the big society, but also at the height of government cuts in public spending, which impacted disproportionately on the voluntary sector. The big society concept, I think, had much to commend it, but it had a fatal flaw. The belief that government and voluntary action are largely incompatible, and that a strong statutory sector serves only to squeeze or crowd out voluntary action. In some ways, the timing of the introduction of the big society was unfortunate for the government, coming up against their austerity programme. But in other ways, it made little difference. The big society was always going to be positioned as an alternative to the big state, whatever the condition of the nation's finances. And this included funding for the infrastructure of the voluntary sector that was seen by ministers as part of the problem. Free voluntary action from the constraints of the state and the bloated voluntary sector, and a thousand flowers, so the argument goes, were bloomed. There was indeed very little historical evidence to support this position. In fact, the scant evidence that exists, based on an analysis of what happened to the sector in the United States during the cuts of the Reagan era, tended to suggest the opposite of the crowd-out effect at work. Although it has to be said that the statistics on levels of volunteering over the past five years also don't provide a great deal of comfort to those in the sector who predicted a slump in volunteering as a result of the cuts. Volunteering appears to trundle along in its own sweet way, largely untroubled by government intervention until you factor in the significant investment in the games that appears to have moved the dial, at least for a short time. And perhaps the massive investment in youth volunteering recently, in Step Up to Serve and NCS, which appears to have been reflected in a significant increase in youth particip participation, while overall levels remain static. And the third lesson of the games, well, the declining interest by government in the infrastructure, both nationally and locally both largely bypassed in the design and delivery, which presents a sea change in attitudes from the high point of the Wolfenden Report in the late 1970s, which coined the phrase intermediary body, and which argued that local support agencies were essential for the development of voluntary action. Infrastructure seems way out of fashion in the brave new world of social media connectivity, 
Though I do wonder if we will need to reinvent it again, albeit in a different guise, if it is allowed to disappear altogether. The Games was in some ways an anomaly, as it was an example of organised volunteering par excellence at precisely the moment when commentators were announcing the death of this form to be replaced by the more fluid, informal concept of social action. This certainly suited the government's big society philosophy, as it could be presented as requiring little money and could be positioned as an alternative to more formal forms of engagement, forms which could be self-organised and certainly didn't require the mediation of local infrastructure. And there is clearly something going on within society, not just digitally, which is fueling this trend. But I'm not convinced that the two forms of engagement are engaged in a zero-sum game, as some would have us believe. And there is surely something deliciously ironic that the government's greatest claim to a volunteering legacy is a heavily organised, heavily funded, nationally organised programme bearing little resemblance to its favoured big society social action rhetoric. So finally, and very briefly, on to story number five. A personal one that raises questions about perhaps the last taboo confronting the volunteering movement, the involvement with the private sector. My father-in-law, um, who a number of years ago suffered a serious stroke, was very well looked after in an NHS stroke unit, where there was a fantastic team of volunteers, led by the indefatigable Tony Blair, not alas that one, who visited him most evenings and shared a beer and a chat about football and the state of the world. When my father-in-law moved to a private care home, I was struck at the lack of volunteer visitors and was informed by the matron that she had tried to organise a programme but had been rebuffed by local volunteer groups who were concerned about placing volunteers in a for-profit setting. I felt uneasy about this and at Volunteering England we began a project funded by the Department of Health to look at the role of volunteers within care homes including within the private sector. The results were encouraging and I believe helped to open up a debate about the ethics of running a volunteering programme within the private sector. This debate has a long way to run and is fraught with dangers. I believe strongly that volunteers should never be used to line the pockets of private investors. But deny, to deny someone the opportunity of a visitor, of a friend, just because they happen to be in a particular organisational setting seems to me to be equally problematic. Perhaps yet another example of Finlayson's moving frontiers. So in conclusion, and to lead us into discussion, what are the big questions raised in volunteering through my journey over the past 25 years? And these are just some of the ones that seem to me to be of particular importance. Does government have a role to play in supporting volunteering, or should it simply get out of the way? Do we need a new debate on the balance between paid and volunteer resources in our communities? And if so, where do we draw the line? Is formal volunteering dead to be replaced by the more fluid informal concept of social action? Is there a role for volunteer infrastructure? And has volunteering lost itself? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>